ladies and gentlemen welcome to the second part of the talk series how to make a marriage work in the first part our speaker our expert suzy singh shared some deep and profound truths about marriage how marriages today have become a means to project a certain social image and appease friends in laws and family members how very few people care to learn the important social skills necessary to navigate the treacherous terrains of marriage today we will discuss some more crucial aspects of marriage to make this journey of life easier and understandable for all of us suzy singh is the author of the best selling book Seven Karma Codes and is the creator of world's first Karma Wisdom Oracle Cards. Suzy is also a relationship counselor and mental health coach. She is an international speaker, certified clinical hypnotherapist, karma coach, and YouTube educator. Welcome, Suzy, to the show. And Thank you, Shivani. Without... It's a pleasure as always. Yeah. And so, without any further ado, let me throw my first question to you. for our listeners tonight what are the major obstacles that come in the way of a happy marriage so i think it's uh, first very important for us all to appreciate that marriage is actually like a mini organization it is probably the smallest unit of an organization and just as organizations need vision they need agreements they need plans they need goals they need objectives so also marriage needs common goals it needs an understanding of what is the vision for that joint entity for those two people who have come together it requires the enrollment of both the participants it requires a deep understanding of stakeholder needs and requirements and i guess unfortunately most of us go into marriage and expect ki by chance marriage चल जाएगी हमारी I don't think we really appreciate that marriage requires the same sort of efficient management that an organization requires. And therefore, I have devised for our listeners today an acronym called GRACE. And I will speak about each one of these elements, these five elements. If we are able to embody them in our marriage, then we will have grace in the marriage and if we don't then we will find hindrances and obstacles in the marriage the first one of course is the idea of common goals we have to appreciate that in a marriage there are actually three entities there is the man there is the woman or if it is a marriage between same genders whatever there is a marriage there are two parties and there is the joint entity of the marriage now the two partners may have personal needs personal aims and aspirations which can sometimes be in contradiction to the joint goals of the marriage and therefore it is very important that when we come together we understand what these common goals for harmony are we agree these common goals or blueprint it's like a charter for the marriage and then whenever there is a sort of confusion conflict difference of opinions we can always revert to say okay i want this you may disagree but let's go back and see what is for the highest good of the third entity which is the partnership the organization of the marriage and that becomes a very good and healthy way to navigate the difference or the conflict in the absence of these common goals there is a great possibility that we'll keep stumbling in the dark we will have disagreements often and we are not being driven by a common um goal or a power or an aim in the marriage the second thing is about which is the r in the grace is about balanced roles and responsibilities if the roles and responsibilities are imbalanced then that will create disappointments in the marriage hindrances towards a healthy marriage because 
one partner may end up feeling that i'm doing everything and the other person is taking me for granted they may feel they are being used or abused they may feel that they are doing all the work and the other one is uh, just not contributing to the marriage there is no support and therefore it becomes very very important that we be able to create something like what i call a marriage health meter so we can agree three levels the first level is what are the zero tolerance issues for both partners those issues have to be mandatory for example uh, mutual respect may be something that is really really important and it may be in small ways also ke aap mujhe tu karke address nahi karoge aap karke address karoge so even small minute details like that because they may be coming from a culture or a background where respect is very key or central so zero tolerance issues must be agreed those are um the marriage is meeting the expectations then there should be a next level which is higher order needs and those become the um you can say exceeds expectations so if we are achieving these things if we are able to let's say not get angry with each other for a whole week or when one of us is getting angry the other one is going to keep quiet and we would resolve our differences the next day or if there are issues about the parents then we don't bring those discussions into the bedroom because it obstructs uh, you know our harmony in the bedroom so there could be some issues that you will decide to put on exceeds expectation list and then there is a third list which is our marriage is rocking or it's really thriving and those may be the really tall orders that um how we are able to negotiate differences in a more peaceful way that the last time something happened we were actually able to sit down and talk it out instead of just blasting the other person so like this we can have a marriage health meter and once in a while i suggest that you actually go to the marriage meter review it maybe once in 3 months once in 6 months and say okay what is the health of my marriage and this is this is a very useful thing because you can get your own um you know you've done your self evaluation you figured whether your marriage is really doing well or it needs some extra input from your side it also allows for complaints to be addressed before they become huge red flags so that is roles and responsibilities in the grace for the few people who just entered in here we're talking about obstacles to a healthy marriage and i was sharing the acronym grace where g is have common goals if you don't have common goals there could be trouble in the marriage and we've just completed speaking about the second one which is roles and responsibilities and how they should be equal roles and responsibilities the third one which is a really really important one and this one is attunement now the word attunement very often you know even in colloquial language we say hamari tuning nahi hai ya hamari bahut achhi tuning hai so it really means i'm tuning into you and in the context of marriage it means that both the partners are exercising sensitivity to the needs and wants of each other and they both have the desire to make the marriage a happy one so how do you achieve attunement and what does it really mean i mean what are the physical actions people need to make the first thing is being present in the marriage and what this really means is are you fully attentive to your partner when you're there a lot of times in couples therapy i find that men and women or one of the partners will say yes he's home or she's home but she's so flaked out she doesn't even know what's happening with me it's like she's not she's physically present but mentally absent or she's somewhere else and that makes the person feel that you don't really care about what i'm discussing this becomes all the more important when let's say one of them is sharing something that is very deeply personal or important to them it could be uh, for a man it could be something at work or a terrible showdown with a boss for a woman it could be a disagreement with a colleague or with a relative or someone in the in-laws and they're feeling very hurt but if the other one is flaking out then it sends out the wrong signal so be very attentive and present when you're interacting with your partner the second one is uh, what i call the triple a and this is how well are you tuned into your partner's aims ambitions and aspirations in all spheres of life do you really know what they want 
what they are yearning for are you checking in with them regularly to see how that is going for them it could be career ambitions it could be their investment plans it could be um you know something in their area of passion something that they do as an extracurricular activity how is that going for them the third one is again very important sexual sensitizing and openness and trust me this is a big one in marriages most couples married for even over decades are just not able to be transparent about their sexual needs they cannot express to the other one what um are erroneous zones for them what what makes them feel happy or makes them feel more blissful or what they dislike what they don't like about that and they even have trouble talking about the subject so there's a lot of sometimes shame sometimes uh awkwardness and as a couple if we can't discuss these things in a pragmatic way then we can't understand each other's needs some things may be turning you off or some things may um you know you may want them but they are not being fulfilled and that can make you feel lonely in the marriage so it's very important that you find the courage overcome whatever beliefs limiting beliefs you might have about sexuality and discuss them openly then of course there is uh what i call understanding love languages because everyone expresses their love in different ways so let's say there is a partner who expresses his love by doing acts of service you know picking you up dropping you getting ready for office 15 minutes before because he has to drop you on the way um helping in the kitchen etc but your language of love is not acts of service you take that for granted maybe your language of love could well be receiving gifts and you feel that uh, at some point you can be in a conflict and you can say what you do what do you do for me you say you love me par aap mere liye karte kya and here we don't realize that we are not recognizing that the love language is different but there is a lot that the other person is trying to do to express his or her love so understanding each other's love languages can make a huge difference to how you appreciate the little efforts how you are complimenting them or acknowledging them and saying i really appreciate that you did abc for me and the fifth aspect of attunement is do you know the trauma history of your partner this is really important because it will help you understand when your partner is feeling scared how does he or she behave what becomes their safety mechanism so very often we find in couples when um they have you know the, a difficult conversation and maybe there is a trigger the man may get sort of shut down because something has come up which is making him feel scared and he will walk out of the room the woman may end up feeling that listen i was discussing something so important and you walked out on me but if we understand that his safety mechanism is he's feeling fearful and he's exercising what we call is the leaving pattern technically and that is only because he is feeling threatened he is in protection mode he does not know how to put his point of view across then you won't feel hurt and upset that the person walked out because you understand his safety mechanism so these five things become really important to you have for you to have a deep deep understanding of your partner and be attuned to them then in the grace we come to the alphabet c which is crowding and so often we'll find that you know fights that happen between partners is primary is a lot of times it's about somebody else said this and you didn't do this for them and they felt hurt and it's not about you too it's about other people and that's crowding the space for your understanding so being very clear or having some sort of an understanding of how you want to deal with other people's issues outside the core of your marriage without getting provoked without getting um too agitated about it that becomes important so that you have space for your marriage to breathe and finally the e is about expression unless you talk your partner will not understand what's bothering you what's on your mind and this is a if it's an unreal expectation a lot of time partners who've been in long marriages will say 
I have been with you for so long. How come you don't even know this about me? And I say that's because your partner's not a mind reader. Why can't you express what you want? Why can't you talk about it? So talking, discussing, communicating, uh, interacting with each other, exploring um, things through dialogue is very important. When grace, all of these five things are not present, that marriage. is going to meet with a lot of obstacles a lot of difficulties but you can always use grace to be able to navigate effectively this grace uh, can you shed some more light on uh, this uh, particular point what do you mean by use grace yeah so grace is the acronym uh, shivi that i have just called out and shared with you so the g of the grace is goals common goals r is equal and shared roles and responsibilities a is being attuned to each other c is don't crowd your relationship with other people's agendas and e is express openly you know how in school we used to create these little acronyms so we remembered them so i decided to give the viewers today this acronym so that even if we don't take away anything and we remember the word grace we will know okay this is what i need to make my marriage move into a better zone I think uh, this is this was very very insightful and very helpful to anybody actually wanting to make their marriage happier. Okay, I'll come to my second question. So very often, you know, the outside interferences they tend to marriage apart. So there could be jealousy from friends or in-laws, and it could be very subtle in nature. You won't even know that they're doing out of envy or jealousy. and you would fall into the trap what the way they are trying to convince you how your part partner is not treating you well or how kind of you are overgiving or oversharing there is kind of you know the, there should be reciprocation from the other end which you are not understanding so how to prevent such things from happening because it's it's these things are very subtle in nature and uh, it's only later we do we come to realize that everything was well in paradise had it not for been for these people who were trying to fill my ears so true shivi and uh, this is why it is said that the foundation of any marriage should be built on trust and trust again is my second acronym for the day so the t starts with invest time to verify the truth without jumping to conclusions so whenever there is a he said she said kind of situation or a conflict because there is a third person's perspective that has now entered the marriage and very often um you know we might get very agitated when we find that some past pain of us is ours is getting triggered or respect is in question or you are feeling humiliated or ashamed because a finger is being pointed at you instead of becoming reactive just take a deep breath and talk to your partner and say okay i want to understand your perspective I want to know what really happened. What is your truth? Don't jump to the conclusion. So it's important there not to get easily provoked, not to become suspicious, not to be too ready to assign the blame. Ke tumne zarur bola hoga aisa, you know, or uh, the other person can't be lying. The minute you do that, you're communicating to your partner that you are lying. The other person could not be lying, which really means. that i doubt you but i have great trust in the other and you can see suddenly we've gone into a comparison and we have actually devalued the marriage we have devalued the partner so it's very important to take a deep breath and say first understand what really happened according to you what's your version of what happened or are you aware of this go to your partner as an ally you know this is what happened this is what so and so said to me what is your view about this so take it in a very pragmatic way like you're going to your best friend and discussing it do not react in the moment that is very very important the second is r which is it's so important to have respect for your partner and that respect comes from i believe in you कोई मुझे कुछ भी कह दे आई बिलीव इन यू एंड दैट पुट्स सो मच 
of a um, i would say deep glue between the two partners because when you feel my partner believes in me you will never do anything to let your partner down also partners must respect the ecosystem and preserve it so wo jisko hum purane zamane mein bolte the ke ghar ki shaan ya ghar ki izzat kai bari we have to sort of we may want to react or we may feel that something is being said which is not right but we have to see if that is the right time and place to bring it up keep the ecosystem in mind so that you don't damage it further that respect for not just the marriage but the people are the stakeholders of in the marriage is very important and it's very important to also forgive mistakes and errors man lo kisi partner se galti hui bhi hai because it's you know sometimes we don't know sometimes maybe um in the in the heat of the moment we've shared something we shouldn't have shared or we've said something which sounded or landed as rude it's okay to forgive them and say okay don't repeat that please because this is how it creates a ripple effect so that is having respect the third the you in the trust is understand their story there are always many many versions many vantage points many perspectives each one will tell the narrative to suit them to make them look good and very often the person who does not open their mouth is getting compromised in this whole game so sabki baat tumne sun li but give equal weightage to your partner it's very important i think here again i just spoke about the safety strategies it's very important to also understand for both partners what are the safety strategies because if you come at your partner with you know you may not say anything but your body language is very angry or threatening then the other partner is going to shut down it's not always verbal violence sometimes it's just body language violence also so partners have to be able to discuss difficult conversations or difficult things or outside accusations when they are feeling calm and peaceful otherwise don't bring it up you're not in the right mental space to discuss it here and i think it's it's very important to have a very compassionate curiosity to understand acha i really want to know ke why do you think this happened or what do you think is going on here so you're not judging what happened you're not blaming anyone in the whole story but you're just curious to understand because that makes the partner feel very safe to say you know this is what really happened or even if they made a mistake they'll be willing to own up because they're not fearful that they'll be shouted at or punished for making an error so providing that safe space in difficult conversations is a must the s is about safeguarding your partner's um interest in public spaces never ever speak against your partner when you're in a group of people or you're in a drawing room situation or either side of the parents are present because that will immediately dishonor or devalue the partner and that can be extremely hurtful so when it comes to social face it's very important to stand by your partner and each must have the feeling that he has my back or she has my back you can go to the bedroom and you can tear each other's hair out if that's what you really need to do but hold your breath in public you must be seen as allies as each other's support and t is having tenacity to protect the marriage and its goals see the tenacity of a marriage or the strength of a marriage is always tested during difficulties and challenging times at any other time when the going is good if you say oh we have a great relationship that's of no use because we want to see what happens to the relationship when somebody gives a big blow to it or when the blow comes from internal disagreements and that time being mindful of that third entity which is the marriage itself the goals of the marriage the need for harmony and what do i need to do so even if i lose my temper even if i get angry how much time does it take for me to get back and apologize how much time does it take for me to if i'm not in the wrong and i the other person has still not apologized just go back and say acha theek hai let's drop it and move on that drop it and move on is very valuable in the tenacity part 
so trust invest time to know the truth about what really happened for your partner respect them understand their story safeguard their interest in public and have the tenacity to pro- protect the goals of the marriage that is important to make sure that nobody outside of the marriage comes and breaks you up right i think suzy you should uh, actually write a book on these insights are very valuable uh, the stop uh, that's it's going to condense it forever so okay uh, i'll ask you the third question so is it pa- possible to have equal partnership in marriage or is compromise the only way to make it work because i've heard a lot that you know one partner has to compromise more or give more and it's never an equal give and take So tell me is it a myth or is it a truth So I think equal partnership is 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 a bit far fledged I like to view this a little differently I see it more as the partners collaborating for growth and mutual gain must equal respect and honoring each other that is very important and the reason i say this is because each partner brings very different skills capacities competencies capabilities to the table and therefore equal sharing may not may just not be possible because you may not have the capacity to do something that your partner may be very good at you know for example very often we hear that uh, when couples are planning let's say travel they'll say that you know the entire plan was done by me i do all the checking out on the flights and booking hotels etc and tumne kya kiya but that person is just not good at doing those things so it doesn't mean that they didn't contribute uh, to the holiday or the holiday planning they may be contributing in some other ways maybe they manage the packing very efficiently and uh, you know locking the house or taking care that the garbage was put out and everything was properly done back home so different capacities means that each one needs to also understand what is my strong suit what do i do well and share that equally the man maybe for example if you're buying a property the man may be very good with all the uh, legal language and the woman may not be so comfortable with that but she may be very good with the accounts so she'll say i'll keep the bookkeeping and you know, when the payments need to be made you make sure that the legal documents are in order so i'm saying split responsibilities take on what it's really saying we are collaborating towards a common aim and that aim is harmony for the two of us and I think what's important is that are equally enrolled to, in the marriage. Are they both equally um concerned about the harmony? Are they willing is if one is going through a very bad phase is the other one showing up for them or is he indifferent or she indifferent to maybe the career challenges somebody may go through or uh, if if a woman is going through ill health is the man showing up for the doctor's appointments or not if there is i think the tricky part comes when there is a conflict with the in-laws is there a willingness to understand to listen and sometimes you can't problem solve but to just understand i know your pain i understand this is difficult for you is enough so being there for each other in a very equal way is more than an equal partnership so to say so share in responsibilities and difficulties show up in hard times and in ill health do not rush discomfort under the carpet hoping that it will vanish and this is again something that a lot of couples do they want to just go you know they'll have a misunderstanding or a fight they just decide to sleep on the edge of the bed they wake up in the morning run off to their offices and they think that okay by tomorrow evening when we come back home everything will be back to normal we'll be speaking normally and the issue will be resolved the issues are never resolved they just keep piling up till they become they start rotting and then you have big breakdowns with small triggers so it's very important that you actually address the disagreement maybe not that night maybe come back the next evening sit over a cup of tea and say can we just revisit what happened yesterday this is my perspective what do you feel 
how can we bridge this gap so that the next time we don't feel so terrible about it so doing that is very important and if one doesn't bring it up the other one should bring it up and it can't always be one the same partner bringing it up both have to make the effort to try and bridge these difficulties correct it's so very I've important often talk. heard that uh, that you know men have a tendency to clam up and just close down if you uh, bring up topics which uh, are conflict related they, they avoid conflict they want to kind of uh, imagine that it doesn't exist so they'll run away or rather feel start feeling very threatened if you bring up a topic they will uh, consider it as a uh, a seed of uh, you know uh, aggression or uh, maybe more conflict to uh, happen in life so they avoid so and then this also kind of you know the woman starts to feel burden that it's only up to me to resolve a conflict and if i don't talk if i talk then also is a problem if i don't talk then also there's a problem is there a way to uh, really uh, resolve this problem of men just uh, clamming up and not being open and not being there whenever you bring up uh, so, you know a, a conflict Or maybe you know some topic which uh, which is uh, harming the marriage or which is uh, so I think uh, yeah two things here if the person is clamming up a there is a possibility that you first need to check in with yourself and say am I being perhaps too aggressive about it because if it's been hurting me then it's possible that I'm coming at it with a great degree of aggression. and then what's happening is that his safety mechanisms are getting triggered and now he's clamped up because he's actually done the leaving pattern and he's disappeared from that conversation itself he may be physically sitting there but he is not engaged in that conversation he is shut down so it's very important this is the reason i said understand the safety mechanisms of each other it's important to address conflict in a safe way without blaming and judging each other and this is something that uh, for our viewers here in part 1 of the stock show we actually discussed about how we should speak to each other this becomes very relevant in such cases shivi where we need to discuss things with the objective of reaching harmony what is the goal in bringing it up very often what happens is it becomes a power dynamic a power struggle a need for my um my ask to be met a need to dominate and control the other and we are not con- aware of it ourselves that we've gone into that mode because we also have our own safety mechanisms we also have our wounding patterns so awareness of my own safety mechanisms and how i talk and behave and the other thing is if you are agitated if you're feeling overwhelmed that's not the time to go into a peace talk these talks must happen when i am able to speak very carefully because what i say is going to have an impact and a lot of couples have not learned how to communicate in marriage we are not taught that we are just brought up observing um either our parents or what we see on the media and we think that we can just speak our hearts out because you know we should be open with our partners but i think we that is what creates a lot of violence in the marriage you can't just speak your heart out because when you're angry you can say terrible things that you're going to regret when you're feeling karma so i always suggest first check in with yourself your first responsibility is to calm and soothe yourself once your nervous system has come to rest is balanced that's the time that you can actually go and engage in a peace talk with your partner thank you susie that was very very helpful um my next question to you is like why do love marriages uh, fall apart more often than arranged marriages because this is uh, we've seen often where marriages that are affected by two families they still kind of you know don't uh, attach the brink of divorce even though that's not a guarantee of a happy marriage but mostly love marriages we see that the conflicts raise it as much earlier and then two people who were uh, proclaiming undying love for each other they can't even stand each other and very soon the marriage is over so how much truth is there in this particular premise and has it been your observation as well and if it is so then why do we see this occurrence you know uh 
love marriage has to go through a right or ritual of maturing because dating is very different from marriage when you are dating your partner there is no existential crisis there is no burden of cooking and cleaning and household chores uh so the everyday weight of issues of of living life has not impacted you and you start seeing that side of each other where people come out of their existential crisis from their respective homes they meet on a date they are in the bubble of let's do something the excitement the romance the to do and it's the rosy a uh, picture that they've seen of each other so they see that dimension and they expect that from the relationship the key goal in dating let's face it is all about chilling and having pleasure so you know you're visiting places you're going for a movie you're going to uh, a gym or where is things that you know young kids today do together but they're all fun activities and then you go back to your parents hotel from there and you go back into the existential crisis which is all about your mom can be telling you what child you left your clothes on the bed you didn't clean up and all that existential crisis is associated with the parent with the mother that you're battling at home or the father who's watching his clock and saying itna late kyun aaye suddenly the parent looks like the bad one and uh, the partner looks like god it was so much fun and then you ready to get romantic with him again you come back and you're texting your partner again so that is one aspect you know how the mind associates the partner with good times and uh, the existential crisis people as the bad time now after marriage what you see those will start collapsing the good times fade into the existential crisis uh the second thing is that marriage involves you're marrying the whole family right so you can't when when you're dating it's just about you and me now marriage suddenly you have to think about okay the siblings and you have to think about the family and you have to think about the rituals and the pujas and all those things that you may not really believe in but you have to go along with and so that starts feeling burdensome and now it becomes your family and my family so the finger pointing begins like meri family to aise nahi hota tha why is it so important i don't believe in this why do i have to sit in that aarti why do i have to sit into that puja etc etc and you don't even realize that this has nothing to do with the partners if it's the culture and you know if the goal of the marriage is harmony then just go along with the culture it's no big deal also the idea of a boyfriend or a girlfriend is a very unidimensional one it's an experiential one whereas when you when the husband when the boyfriend becomes a husband you'll suddenly notice many other dimensions of him you'll see him in the presence of his mother and he's suddenly the son you see him in the presence of a sibling and he's suddenly the brother now these are things that you've not seen at such close quarters before because you always just met one dimension of him which was the boyfriend which was the romantic in him and now you're seeing these other shades which you may or may not like and that can create a dissonance oh my god has he changed and we actually end up in love marriages people will end up saying you've changed it's not that you've changed it's just that you weren't really exposed to other dimensions of the person and you know you may not even be familiar like you may know this boy very well and this or this girl very well and they may be very different in their ecosystems because they have now achieved in similar ways or they have common career goals they wear the same clothes they talk the same language but the families could be a far cry from this so we may have situations where uh, either of the partner is very progressive but the family is very orthodox and now you have to also engage with the family and how do you navigate that bridge between but i thought you know your family would understand this and the family does not understand this and he stuck or she stuck trying to bridge that gap of cultures of the 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 climate in the family or the ecosystem in the family and you can't really go change your mother or father right you just have to accept them and go along with it so I think this is why love marriages have to go through this transitional phase of uh, 
you know marriage is going to be very different and um, also when i'm dating i can always walk away from it i can block the guy and say i break up you can't really walk away from marriage in the same way it's for keeps so i can break up is not an option and that makes you feel very very stuck and vulnerable in many cases and this is the reason why i think love marriages uh, need to work harder than arranged marriages because in an arranged marriages i think both partners go in with a little bit of a trepidation they are a little more cautious they are a little more careful they are testing the waters they know they don't know each other and they are willing to adjust and adapt whereas in a love marriage you think oh i know the other partner and suddenly you realize i don't really know everything about him so okay, you can uh, this is the wind right Yes, yes. This is this is bringing to my mind another question, which mostly young girls of uh, current times encounter in after they get married. You may be very liberated. You may be wearing uh, all kinds of modern clothes and reveling in them and uh, getting compliments. And even your boyfriend uh, must be appreciating you for your look and your attire. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, once you're married, then you are expected to toe the line of family culture or tradition. You are expected to wear a sari or maybe a lot of jewelry, which you will not be used to it. And why I'm pointing it out because you just said that it's if the culture is different, what's the big deal? Uh, adopt it. Uh, for many women of uh, you know of uh, who have this modern education and have the experience of uh, being out there in the world and doing uh, every kind of thing, they might be feeling uh, uh, very upset about this. That why do I have to change my personality or my likes or dislikes or the things I wear just because? the boy's family uh, is of a certain mindset that the bahu should look a certain way or dress a certain way and they find it very very debilitating and this can become a source of conflict or inner angst you may not be expressing it but you might be resenting it a lot uh, should uh, you know should it be really a big issue for a girl uh, or uh, you know is there a way to kind of convince uh, your husband or even your in-laws that uh, what you wear uh, it does not determine the level of respect that you have for them and nor should you be judged with that lens that you know I'm, I'm too liberated or I don't care about family relations or I'm, um, I'm you're leaving a bad impression uh, on other family members by dressing the way I want so uh, Susie what do you have to say about it how can a woman I mean should she simply adapt to the family uh, style or uh, should she really negotiate her way through this uh, problem I think uh, she first has to do a litmus test of how extreme her situation is, and if the entire family, if all the other bahus are dressing in a certain way, and you suddenly become the whistleblower, that's not really going to go down very well for you. And quite honestly, that is that is part of the premarital exercise and checkup that you should be doing. That. Did you have a clear understanding that you were entering into a family culture like that? And have you knowing that have you agreed to go into the marriage? And if you have, then you should be willing to adapt because that's some um agreement with yourself you should have made in the premarital stage itself. But if it's coming as a complete shock to you that means ki homework tumne shaadi se pehle pura nahi kiya hai and now this is something that is completely new. if that be the case if you have ended up in a marriage like that i always suggest it's important to be wise about how you address it you're dealing with humans humans have a certain nature which is habit driven people may also have certain um social dogmas that we our family has to be seen in a certain way and i suggest that when you are attending family dinners where other um, relatives are going to be present then align with the family culture do not show your in-laws or your husband in a poor way just align with it understand that this is important to them and i'm doing it because i love them or i'm learning to love them or i'm learning to be mindful about their life and how they've lived their life and when you are by yourself then you can dress as you please once you win the hearts of your in-laws once they start seeing that you are making an earnest effort to settle in 
you can always negotiate your way later but this takes patience and it takes work and it takes presence you can't go in there with a the spirit of activism and expect to make things uh, right that activism should have come into play before the marriage mujhe shaadi karni hai ya nahi karni hai So I'll come to my next question. So, uh, is patriarchy or feminism responsible for the difficulties people face in marriage? Now, like both these things are huge ideologies which are influencing uh, our lives, and they are also at loggerheads with, uh, with each other most of the time. And they they are uh, influencing the way we conduct ourselves or live our lives or interact with others. People come with different mindsets. Uh, What do you have But, to say about this? You know, Shivi, the thing is that both when we talk of either of them, we talk of patriarchy and feminism. We are really talking about some form of activism that we feel we are mm-hmm. we are rebelling against something. We are rebelling against a concept, and when we are doing that, such concepts are built on power dynamics. They are built on competitiveness. They are built on someone must lose and someone must win. so there is an inherent undercurrent of violence if we are embodying either of the two and uh if we are saying that the goal of a marriage needs to be harmony but we are actually embracing it with the spirit of activism and violence then it goes without saying that is going to damage the relationship because so much energy is going to get spent uh in placing our attention on that violence on i have to win this battle i have to have my way i have to change this so you'll go into defense mode you go into protection mode you're not going into harmony and peace at all and um either you won't feel safe or your partner won't feel safe because you know that everything is going to uh, just going to blow up it's going to become a big issue I have always uh, felt that nothing can germinate in a war zone. There's nothing good that will ever come out of that. So you have to just sit down and think that is it patriarchy and feminism? And a lot of times I have had people who will call me up and they'll say, "Are you a feminist? Women's right? This and the other? Will you support our cause?" And I said, "No, no, I am human rights. So can we follow humanism, not feminism or patriarchy?" and if we do feel very strongly about either of these two aspects the question to explore and investigate is why am i feeling so strongly about patriarchy and feminism and do that work within you and you know you will find something really shocking in all of my work i have done and with thousands of women i have checked this women who are fiercely against patriarchy when i scan their subconscious beliefs they have thousands of pro patriarchy beliefs which are coming all the way down their ancestry from their grandmothers so on the surface you're fighting patriarchy but deep down you are so pro patriarchy that you don't even realize that you're supporting the system you're broadcasting what's in your subconscious mind and it's an inner battle you're really engaged with so if you can work on your inner self and bring peace to your inner self and then work with whatever is on the outside because we anyway understand that the macrocosm is a reflection of the microcosm which is whatever is inside of me is going to be reflected in my experience so if i have attracted the experience of this patriarchal family can i check in with myself and say oh my god i hope i'm not carrying subconscious beliefs that are pro patriarchy in this case and i'm saying regardless of where you're at the one big change that you can definitely make because you like i said you can't change your in-laws you can't change your parents you can't uh, you know let's say your parents believe that my property should only go to the sons not to the daughters you can't go and change your parents or fight with them that's ridiculous but you can change it for your progeny you can treat your sons and daughters equally you can say okay i want to bring up my children in an environment of humanism I want to impart those values to them and that's how we start changing the world one step at a time by changing ourselves by 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 giving our children that kind of environment. That's uh uh yes that's a very profound answer to me yes we need to really check within ourselves whether 
what is it that i am carrying within myself which is reflecting in my surrounding if i am feeling very oppressed uh, in my marriage owing to patriarchy which is heavily present perhaps i may be carrying with a too much of resentment or certain patriarchal beliefs myself otherwise it would not have manifested in such a way uh, i agree with you um, coming to my next next question often finance related uh, issues they they try with a couple of part so there is a difficulty in values preferences and priorities so how, how can a couple find a meeting ground when finance or money is the most uh, is the biggest uh, source of conflict in a marriage how we spend how we save uh, things like this so three things make a marriage easier to navigate the first one is healthy physical and psychological intimacy the second is financial ease and the third is adequate space or room to be yourself and to grow and if intimacy is the glue that keeps a marriage going financial comfort is the engine lubricant so it's very important to understand that first i talk about financial comfort you need money for romance you need money to enjoy the marriage so if you want to go out for a meal you want to go for a movie you want to travel because you need to also momentarily or uh, periodically get out of your existential crisis or you know working couples they come home too tired they want to order food in you need money for all of those things so smart planning becomes important you also need savings to start feeling secure about your future because a lot of young ones today are uh, because they they spend well they also worry about their future and how things are going to be so they need to save well and then there also needs to be freedom to spend the money without having to offer explanations or to take permission from the other person okay is it okay if i go out and buy a dress for myself when finances are not openly discussed in a marriage it's actually symptomatic of a couple of things which is lack of trust in each other there are some conflicting goals and needs which must be discussed and negotiated for example uh where is the money being spent or is there some money that uh, a partner feels that they want to give to their parents usually that happens or towards the household expenses if they are living with the parent there may be some outflows which are not being discussed or shared and that's very important there could also be a weak connection or understanding where either of the partner starts feeling that if i tell if the wife feels that if i tell my partner i have this money then he will put it all into his business or he may ask for that money and i am saving it up to buy my gold or my jewelry so that fear that my needs may not be honored and again this is showing weak connection or there may be a fear of conflicts a hidden need to dominate the relationship in a lot of marriages i find that they want to keep the we the woman financially weak so that they can control her because if she becomes financially independent then she'll start becoming very dominating she'll start asking for her ways so this is also a mindset or a thinking that just don't give uh, the financial leash into her hand don't let her become too independent the way to solve for this really and to have a healthy financial arrangement in a marriage is first be completely transparent about the inflow of money what are your earnings how much are you spending how much are you gifting and how much are your investments this should be discussed openly between the two partners secondly there must be mutual independence to spend for both partners so it's important that both partners have a certain amount or a budget or a percentage of whatever they are earning that they can spend without having to provide explanation so if either partner wants to spend either on their parent or they want to go indulge themselves or they want to buy uh, an expensive brand whatever they are not answerable ke tum ye kya kar rahi ho iski kya zarurat thi because that then becomes oppressive there also needs to be i think contribution to savings now if both partners are working of course they can both contribute to the saving if there is only one partner working then very often if there is a lean period or you find that the expenses have gone through the roof 
then or you've just had a trip and therefore you need to conserve your finances then it's important that the wife also kind of save on the household expenses or contribute in her own ways to becoming more economically focused for that month so that's a contribution to savings and economics and finally there has to be a common agreement on financial planning and investments where are you putting your money both partners must have a say you know they may want to um buy property or they may want to put it into mutual funds or whatever else but that there must be an agreement there i think uh, sometimes people ask me how should we go about doing this and i say well create a common account for household expenses so let's say it's a case where both partners are earning you can create whatever income is coming in you just contribute a certain percentage each partner can contribute based on their income ratios to that common account and this can go towards household expenses then you can have a savings account which is and when i say savings account i'm just saying that you a certain percentage that you would save every month from your salaries you can have a gifting account which is okay is kuch len den some shagan somebody's birthdays anniversaries you're going somewhere to a friend's place so there's a gifting account and finally there is a personal account which is i do not need to tell you where i spent this money and therefore i feel i have the freedom to spend there if there is only one income then i think there is one added um account that needs to come in which is pocket money for the partner that's not earning and very often in the olden uh, times you know our moms or women of the house did all this by hiding that little savings from the family income into the atta or the chini ka dabba but i'm saying it shouldn't have to be that very gracefully whoever is earning whether the husband or the wife whichever partner is earning should be able to contribute some pocket money to enable that person to go and you know maybe do parlor expenses or just just call it maintenance expenses whatever but personal expenses so if you can manage your financial understanding in this way i don't think you will have problems uh, going ahead i think that's uh, these points are maybe quite new for my listeners tonight because uh, i haven't really come across anybody making separate account for separate expenses in a marriage kind of they manage just on the go but that's a very good idea uh, and people can surely consider uh, these things so uh, also another important uh, thing is that uh, should family education money social status uh, be the parameters when you are trying to fix a match uh, mostly in arranged marriages we see that people do take into consideration these aspects um, so or uh, you know only compatibility or the mutual chemistry should be enough for two people to come together in a marriage because uh, have you seen that uh, you know, these things creating uh, a vitiated atmosphere later because there's a difference in social status and there is a difference in personal experiences and there's a difference in education level so how important are these things when trying to uh, fix a match shivi they are really important and i cannot uh, over emphasize this because as humans we are habit driven creatures and we are very resistant to change now when the backgrounds the family backgrounds and cultures are very close to each other then we are reducing the amount of change that is going to be required to adapt into the new environment and therefore settling in can become a much easier process you're going to make it really hard for yourself if you're going to go into a marriage where uh, the backgrounds are very varied or different because it's going to require a lot more understanding uh, on both sides to be able to bridge the gap and like we always say birds of a feather flock together because they resonate you know people when you're like minded you you had similar experiences you had the similar kind of education or money to spend then your lifestyle issues become very similar and that that contributes to your compatibility you know you you can be able to uh understand each other better at least the basics are taken care of then there may be other things that you need to work on 
it also reduces conflicts about what may be considered normally in one family background and may be considered completely abnormal for example if uh, you know somebody comes from let's say a working family and um, they are very into or they are very well off and there is an important business meeting the man has to go for the partner has to go for and maybe the girl's family comes from a different um, lower strata much lower strata and there is an expectation or there is a puja where the the, the son in law has to be present but he can't make it there'll be a lot of disappointment it may or may not be expressed but this girl will come away feeling very disappointed that my husband let us down but if they were both coming from the same social strata there'd be an understanding uh, that look this was an important meeting that he just couldn't miss it is not a reflection of not that my parents are not important and the families will appreciate and understand they will adapt they will understand so small things can be blown out of proportion because they've been seen as abnormal <clears throat> or they'll be seen as offensive and uh, misunderstandings can perpetuate in this manner if you're not coming from the same kind of backgrounds i think also in terms of i think a lot of judgmentalism can also be avoided in a marriage if uh, there is less difference in education and financial and social status uh, in the families of the two people marrying each other because we often tend to look down upon our own partner if he's less educated or less financially well off or we may have uh, not uh, and doesn't have too many important connections to most of his life so uh, i have a feeling that these things can also seep into a marriage later on and you might feel very dissatisfied with your choice or your uh, family's choice because i have encountered uh, uh, such relationships where uh, the girl was very upset because she felt that her parents were rich enough to uh, find an is officer for her and get uh, they uh, married her to a junior engineer and this kind of it uh, it this dissatisfaction uh, lasted a lifetime for her and they should, there was never a time where she wasn't complaining about this fact and i'm sure that it must have affected her relationship with her husband as well so uh, i i do feel that uh, yes uh, these things uh, must be taken into account uh, they are very important you are you are the people you are the because you know to that agreed So there'll be so many other question. there'll be there'll be so many other issues that you really have to work on to make that a harmonious marriage that this is uh, one thing that you can really not impose upon yourself and i suggest that even when when you are dating uh because you know that that dating may translate into marriage try and find or date people similarly in, in the same cultural vicinity or uh, mm-hmm. ecosystem with vicinity as yourself mm-hmm. and then obviously these labels also are very uh, are kind of thrown around around very easily that if there's a girl of us if the if the family is looking for a suitable match nobody will raise a finger but if the girl is aware enough to find a partner who is kind of equal to her in her uh, social uh, and educational status or even financial status then she is often labeled as a gold digger which is something i think quite derogatory jam by uh, you know it's our right to look for somebody who we feel uh, is the best choice for us and why should uh, this factor be looked down upon and uh, i think that it's high time that people really come out of these uh, narrow mindsets it's not about being a gold digger it's about uh, uh, looking for somebody uh, who's a good match for you for whom you want to uh, you can enjoy uh, you know a harmonious life at least few aspects are taken care of uh, while others may still be there to work upon great so uh, i'm coming to the next question uh, what is the significance of me time in keeping a marriage together how important it is for the couples to spend spend time apart from each other i'm so glad you asked this question shivi because women can become dangerously self sacrificing or subservient to maintain familial harmony and um, this can really lead to very deep seated resentment which is uh, because it's not addressed because she keeps suppressing her own feelings um she can have volatile outbursts and there is a lot of 
day to day reactiveness feeling irritable feeling angry feeling upset and of course it is all very diffused so sometimes you'll be losing it on the uh, helper in the house and somebody you'll be shouting at the kids because actually you're not really getting any time to attend to your own needs and have your own needs met so this really results in devaluing your own self it destroys the peace in in the house actually and which is really counterintuitive because if i'm always on the edge or if i'm always feeling volatile inside and i'm suppressing myself that's a pressure cooker effect so you are going to blow it off at some point with the slightest amount of trigger women can also those uh, women who tend to fall sick very frequently their body is trying to tell them something that you are you are just not attending to yourself and you're stretching yourself too much and somehow women just tend to so many of them lose their self identity and you know when they hit their 50s they're actually sitting and saying where did i go who am i who was that girl who went to college did i even have my dreams they've just for the first 30 years in marriage they haven't even attended to themselves so her circle of giving becomes everybody else in the nucleus and she is the thin membrane of the cell on the periphery outside which is ready to disintegrate and the way i suggest it should really be is put yourself back in the nucleus me in the nucleus the second ripple should be me and my husband and me and my children and me and my in-laws then me and my siblings and then me and all the other relatives in my community now when i do that what am i really doing i am filling my peace tank first i am taking care of my needs from this peaceful state i am now connecting with my husband or my children or my in-laws or my parents etc like that when she is full inside she can give joyfully she can give happily she can give uh with ease otherwise she is giving through compulsion forcefully not gladly and therefore when i look at what does she need to do she needs of course me time and when i say me time i'm referring specifically to um active activities that she engages in which she enjoys doing now that could well be for someone um uh, you know activities with her own self like painting and pottery and gardening or it could be activities with other women which is she likes to go to a kitty party or a book club or a, you know something like that a music class etc but it's an active activity then she needs we time which is time spent with her spouse where it could be the evening walk together after they come back from work or he comes from work and they download their days and what they've been through so that they are in connection with each other on a daily basis and finally she needs downtime before she goes to sleep at night so that she can allow herself to de-stress she can sleep peacefully and she can have a good night's rest so it's me time we time and downtime and she needs all three of them um i think and uh, suzi uh, what is the importance of being physically fit uh, to keep a marriage happy because we often see that once people get married and they become very care- careless about their personal health and they will become obese and be out of shape and then complain that you know my partner does not find me attractive anymore and they will invest very little in the personal fitness uh, eating healthy and uh, you know the exercising or, or even women mostly complain that they don't have the time because mostly they are devoting all the time to taking care of the household in laws a uh, children husband which is true obviously it's not easy for even a housewife to find time for self care but do you think that it is important and no matter what uh, time must be taken out uh for uh, maintaining your physical health because uh, a lot depends on it to keep the marriage together happy as well as your own self happy and efficient and working and upbeat what do you have to say about that so i think uh this is a question of personal priorities and mm-hmm. some people will prioritize it regardless of the challenge on time some people just don't put it high enough on their list But if you ask me in isolation is it important i think it is terribly important because uh, i for one i mean i go for my morning walk i go for my evening walk i do my yoga 
I think it is so important also because it allows you to have a connection with your own core. It allows you to have a connection with the earth. And all of these allow for embodiment. I am in my body. I exist. The body is a temple. I learned to take care of this temple. I am not going to um, deprioritize myself where I'm falling sick frequently. It's so important to value this temple that we have been given. Mm. And not just from a perspective of feeling attractive, but also from feeling energetic, also from having your prana flow through your bodies in the right way. Because when the prana is flowing right, then all of your body organs are going to remain healthy. If some part of your body is, is becoming depleted of prana, it is going to become diseased. And when you fall sick, your whole family is going to be troubled by it. So why do you want to wait, wait for that, you know, unwise eventuality? Prioritize yourself today. Of course, you won't have the time. Because time is always in today's day and age. Um, I think we are all short of time and 24 hours are just not enough. But not just physical uh, well-being. I think sleep is more important than physical well-being also so i always say number one is are you sleeping well at night that is number one and two is your physical health then is your emotional um check-in and how you're and of course fourth is are you overthinking because there are really three machines you have the mental the intellectual you have the emotional and you have the active or the physical if you're overthinking you definitely need to the antidote for overthinking is get your body moving. And so all three machines need to be in balance and work in balance for you really to be at your energetic best, to have the prana flowing freely and both from a spiritual perspective as well as I would say a sexual perspective as well as an energy perspective going out and performing in the world all these dimensions it's so important to take care of your physical health uh, and also like i'll come to another very important uh, malady which plagues marriage not all of them but a lot of them and that is extramarital relationships so why do extramarital relationships happen and do the signs appear much uh, before the, the, the actual infidelity so, uh, extramarital relationships happen for the most obvious reasons because one partner or both partners are not feeling loved and understood. There is a lack of attention and emotional nourishment. There is a lack of intimacy at all levels, emotional, conversational, physical, psychological. So in real ways, the partners have really grown apart. And this happens slowly and over a period of time so what happens is that both partners are not even aware that this has happened because it is so slow and general. And as you start becoming distant from each other, you just take life for granted because you see things on the surface. You are not checking in on that marriage health meter at all to see that have I dipped below my meets expectation level that I spoke of at the beginning. So when your marriage is going below expectation, you think that just because there's food on the table and we're sleeping in the same bed, you know, marriage chal rahi hai. But actually, there is no fire in the marriage. There's no spark there. And the causes are, of course, not feeling connected or uh, the partner's feelings are trivialized. There may be abuse in the relationship too. There may be secrets in the relationship. Uh, you may not have common interests anymore. You may not have great sex. Um, there may be not no trust and um, you know there are so many marriages today Shivi, it is shocking but there's there's sexless marriages they haven't they haven't um, experienced love in the bodily way for maybe um, years if not months and they they're just not having fun together there are no holidays life is too mechanical too boring there are too many burdens there are too many responsibilities and too little fun 
and of course there can be extreme cases where there is alcoholism and there is some drug abuse or substance abuse there is a uh, behavioral issues there are anger issues in the marriage uh, or the partner starts feeling much too alone or there's too much interference from the in-laws so all of these then means i'm stifled i'm suffocated i my my love tank is so empty that i'm now willing to look for nourishment outside and some of the signs of course are that women will stop responding to sexual urges or to sexual moves by the partner they will just go cold they will withdraw they will check out emotionally um they may have long be having longer conversations with their friends on the phone because women like to discuss things and get it off her chest and men may stop tuning in to the family problems and just be on the periphery and you know not take any interest they may start working very late or they will travel frequently or they will do the other thing which is uh, you know suddenly start becoming oversweet which is not normal because they are overcompensating for their guilt they may be in both cases i find that the partners become very possessive about their phones and um you know they will always want to keep track of their phone and you will find that they're suddenly not leaving their phones in an area where the other partner may pick it up and see it and uh, men may also go more frequently drinking with the boys or at least the excuses i'm drinking with the boys or i'm working late etc but clearly there's a coldness or a detachment that enters the relationships uh there may be just superficial harmony or it could get very nasty and acrimonious and the one thing that's clear is that both are easily triggered by each other it doesn't take very much for conflict to arise or for them to become shut down with each other if you look at their body language their body language will be closed they're probably sleeping on the edge of their beds uh they don't like touching each other anymore you know even if accidentally somebody's hand on a dining table will touch the other the other person will withdraw so if you observe body language very clearly you can tell that it's happening and for women particularly i've seen this very often women can smell when their partners are strained they can smell it literally they they have an intuitive sense or whatever but a lot of women tell me this that i just know it when my partner is strained even though his behavior may not have changed so i think it's very important for us to be very vigilant at the early signs that something is happening and to address it so that you know we don't wait to find out that there has been a romantic association and then feel very betrayed because then rebuilding trust in the marriage can become a very laborious and uphill task so uh, how to kind of for example the woman or the husband has smell that infidelity is taking place so what's the best way to address it like should uh, should the partners i mean the partner confront the other one and i know that you are cheating and because obviously there are going to be shouting matches and things just for the guilt and shame and all of these things come into the picture uh, which may you know instead of bringing them together it can uh, you know make the, the partner the strained partner run to to the <laughs> to the boy you know shivi actually i think even before the string happens there is a lot of ignored red flags and that's the time to address it that's the time you can still rescue the marriage because your partner is um, is is feeling very lonely people don't just mostly people don't of course there are the 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 uh, sex maniacs and the nymphomaniacs and the the men chasing women and anything in skirts that's a completely different thing that's not part of how normal most people are most people will give the marriage a good enough chance or their partner a good enough chance and then it, it their their lives become really painful and mechanical before they actually stray and somebody appears on the scene but they can start sharing and talking and it usually always starts with emotional dependence before it becomes physical so that means that there is emotional nourishment is missing in the marriage and uh, that doesn't dry up overnight it dries up over a period of time so make sure that um, emotional lubrication is taken care of if you stop talking to each other if you have uh, if you don't know what's on their minds then that's a sign of trouble that's the time to address it in the marriage don't wait till things get out of hand or you discover or start suspecting that you know they have strayed uh, 
that was wonderful speech very very enlightening very very powerful uh, empathic talk we delivered on marriage and the deeper intricacies and of marriage it's not easy it's like a whole life lesson packed into one relationship and if you can really na- manage to navigate it well i think you have learned a lot of lessons of life which you had decided to before coming on earth and it's like a whole entire crash course in evolution if you if i really look at it that way because it requires so much of a man so much of mindfulness so much of uh, uh you know self study and self exploration to be able to make a success of marriage and which should be coming from not only one but both the partners so it's like a big exercise thank you so much sunil that was so really very empowering uh, everything that you said is is worth its weight in gold and i do hope that the listeners tonight have uh, absorbed as much as possible from this talk because it can change your life if you actually uh, ponder over it to reflect over what suzy has shared with us uh, it can really have a very trans- transformative effect on your life not only yours but also your children because you want to impart all of these learnings to them as well it's, it's marriage is not easy and obviously you must take into account when uh, getting married it's not going to be a walk in the park it's not going to be all uh, rainbows it's going to be a lot of work a lot of effort a lot of awareness a lot of learning is going to happen so please enter it with that mindset and then definitely you can hope to have a beautiful marriage married life uh, i open this uh, session for questions if anybody has a uh, jamuna maitri himanshu if any of you have any questions you are please free to ask them No. Yeah, I have a question, uh, Shivi. Uh, yes. It is. Uh, I mean, this is a very commonly used phrase in those days also that only in difficult times is the uh, value of us uh, of the partner known. And uh, it's true. It's true. Like everybody, when we go go through any kind of difficulty, that is the time when, a, as you said, marriage is tested. So, um, would you recommend? Uh, for the other spouse maybe who, who is going through a difficult time and not getting that kind of support they what should be the approach to follow i think it's very important for you to speak to the partner without blaming and saying i am not receiving support but to specifically ask for what is required like it would be i would feel very reassured if you can come with me to so and so place or i would feel very like if, you know if you're going for a doctor's appointment and let's say you're going to so, through some ill health issues i would really feel less scared if you were with me ask for that need in a very specific way what i find is very often men are willing to provide that or the partners willing to provide it but they don't really know what it is you need so if you can be specific that would help and don't be critical or don't be blaming don't say i expected that you would be there for me but you aren't that's a judgment that's a criticism that won't go down that discussion will just go downhill so ask for your need in a very specific way and there's a possibility it will be met have that faith or confidence if it is not met then you can ask why that person is not able to provide you that maybe there is something some deep insight that you have missed Very nice. Thank you so much, Susie. It's very, very clear and very Thank right. You. Thank you. Thank you for being for our listeners uh, two times in a row. Uh, that was very, very magnanimous of you. That was very uh, wonderful of you to have spent so much time in this dissecting marriage for everybody and to understand what's the what's his higher purpose in an individual's life. Thank you so much once again from the bottom of my heart. Uh, thank you for being on the show thank you everybody for thank you shivi uh, being here for having me and i have just just one simple mantra to everybody be present in your marriage that will make all the difference be present in your marriage that's the mantra that's the better okay so let's wrap up the session thank you so thank much you, everyone that was very lovely